Good Here we you. are, you know, beginning today where I guess this project began, you know, a few months ago, which is uh, here at this table in this shop. <laughs> uh, here it is. Look at that. This is now finished up, really. The blessing day, it's you a chance to wear it. I mean, what a great uh, just coincidence. I mean, it's both the pool and Davidoff of London Green. De it is. Destiny is yeah, a destiny. That's yes, right, I think destiny. <laughs> and the deeper section for my cigar cutter. Oh, it just feels like it was made for it. <laughs> That's what we do. That's what we do. Hi, I'm Kirby Allison, and I'm thrilled to be here inside the Edward Sahakian Cigar Lounge at the Bulgari Hotel, uh, London, here in Knightsbridge. Uh, Simon and I have been invited by Eddie, of course, after what has been just a beautiful morning, and one that we have been looking forward to for a long time, which is the delivery of this masterpiece you created for Eddie, his very first bespoke suit, but not just bespoke suit, his very first pure bespoke suit. So, uh, Eddie, thank you so much for, you know, inviting us. And of course, it's only appropriate that, you know, what really is a milestone, I would say, of, you know, not just the opportunity to commission your first bespoke suit, but your first bespoke suit from a house like Poole is a moment to be celebrated. And so I've enjoyed so much being able to accompany you on that and to share that with you and uh, shared with everyone, of course, watching here on YouTube and and a moment to savor. And thank you so much for having us here at your father's beautiful lounge. My dear Kirby, what an honor to welcome you. What an honor to welcome you, Simon, as well. Uh, I have been the beneficiary of generosity and kindness from the two of you and friendship. Uh, I would very much like to reciprocate in a very small way by hosting you here for what will be the very first cigar this amazing garment will experience. Yeah. Yeah. I assure you it will not be the last. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to really celebrate it with no two better people than both of you. So without any further ado, may I offer you a cigar? I'll be delighted. Eddie, thank you very much for allowing myself to join you here today with, of course, Kirby. First time here. Lovely lounge, very exceptional here in Knightsbridge. Um, and, and and I will be known to a few and that I am a little bit novice when it comes to two cigars. I had my little places where I've enjoyed them, Savannah in the USA, and New Orleans, but this is really the you know, a magical moment to be here with yourself. So please, I'm honored to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank well, you. I, I'm the true student, uh, you know, here today, you know, in the company of, of two, you know, really titans of industry. And so I think that, um, you know, what's great about this is that, you know, you have so generously shared with us, you know, the bespoke process. And now, you know, Eddie is able to share with you what he has so generously shared with me throughout our friendship, which is his absolutely infectious passion for cigars. So you're in for a treat. And, um, I don't know, how does one celebrate, uh, you know, in a moment like this, you know? What do we smoke for, for my first cigar with this suit? And really, I went back to the first cigar I ever had, which was, of course, the Davidoff number no. 2. Uh, it's so elegant. It's a light, creamy blend. It lends itself to these moments beautifully. It doesn't overpower. So if I may, Simon, may I offer you a Davidoff number two? That sounds absolutely perfect, I must say. <laughs> Gen and break it in ah, gently. There we go. <laughs> Look what I found in this oh, the amazing garment. <laughs> That's the idea. Here we are. Uh, a Dominican Anniversario number two. Uh, in fact, the signature number two, I should say, with classic pigtail. Simon, I please don't feel like you are an amateur or a novice in, in the world of cigars. We all are, truthfully. Mm. The only difference is how much practice we put into it. So I know you're a busy man. You may not have the chance to practice as much as I do. However, your palate is an expert. Everyone's palate is an expert. So please 
trust your palate, even if you haven't used it very often on a cigar. I hope it'll tell you that this is an enjoyable cigar. It won't be too strong. Mm -hmm. So the Dominican leaf is typically light, a creamy blend. It won't be strong. You'll get good mouthfeel. You won't get too much of the peppers and spices that you can find in some blends. Mm. Um, and it's a cigar that can serve you well after breakfast oh. or indeed after a good lunch. Right. After a big dinner, you'd probably want something a little heartier. We'll come on to that at a later date, I'm sure. Oh yeah, absolutely. Simon, may I have the honor of cutting and lighting it for you? Please, and, and uh, you know, give, please give me some tips about cutting it because I'm always cautious about how much to cut or how little to cut. So in my world, it's lovely to ask let, these let questions me, here. Let me pass it over to you just so you can observe the construction of the cigar and you will note there's a cap there with yep. a twisted end. Now yep. that's called a pigtail and that's on what's called the head of the cigar. Right. And we distinguish that from the foot of the cigar, which is of course where the lighting happens. Yep. Um, when you're coming to cut the cigar, of course the tools are important. And I'll just demonstrate on my own. You need a good sharp cutter. There's different styles of cut that can be used and uh, we can run through those at a later date. I'm gonna use a straight cut on this cigar. It lends itself to the dimensions and proportions. And when you wanna cut, if you can imagine, or you see the head of the cigar, there's little shoulders as they slope down and reach the body of the cigar. You wanna cut in the midst of that shoulder, not where it's ended the sloping and not at the very beginning of it. And the intent is really to open up the head so that it draws well into the mouth, but not to cut too deep so that you risk unwrapping the cigar. The cigar. Yeah. I've been there before. <laughs> we all have. Exactly. Yes. No, it's lovely. Lynn. May, may no, please. I? Yeah, thank you. You're very welcome. So, as I mentioned, I'm going to use a lovely guillotine cut on that. And you can see here, I'm just preparing. Yep. I'm not going too deep, not too shallow. And of course, a nice one cut. Firm action. Yep. You have to be assertive with it, otherwise, it can catch. May I light it for you? Be my pleasure. Thank you. Simon, yep. uh, my father will be upset with me because I'm using a turbo flame, of course, but I find it's very accurate, even with a thin gauge like this. Kirby actually has the correct lighter for an indoor setting. Uh, uh, but his has a yellow flame. Right. This is a blue flame. Yep. Requires Not a little bit more patience. That's it. But I promise you I will be very cautious with this. And I notice you're keeping it a little bit away. From the just area. exactly. It's yeah. very strong and, and hot flame. Around. So I just want to get it toasting and lighting without getting too high up the body of the cigar. But that's what obviously what you do with a turbo. Yes. Gotcha. Yeah. You know, and if you're outside, you know, it's windy. I mean, this is really the only way to light a cigar. Yeah. I mean, matches or a soft flame, uh, you'll yeah. only frustrate yourself. Yeah. <laughs> um, Simon, so, I'm sure you've had a cigar before, yeah. so. No need to tell you not to inhale. No. <laughs> uh, and what you're hopefully going to have there is the virgin puff, oh. when it's been perfectly combusted. And do you moisten a little bit of the end before no you... Need to, no need to, however you're comfortable. Okay, okay. You get, this, you get the taste, don't you? Yeah. And it's, you know, it's a bit like a good wine. You yeah. can suddenly feel it going round. You even got a nice little retro hell there. I saw it coming out of your, <laughs> your nose. That's, uh, that's advanced smoking. Hmm. Oh, let me see if I can oh. pull a rabbit out of my pocket. Okay. Ah, oh, there we really. go. <laughs> wow. I may have done that once or twice before. <laughs> I got the year of the rabbit here from, again, from Davidoff. It's, it is a, a richer, fuller bodied blend. And I think you will enjoy it. Ah, well, I mean, if, you, if you've selected it for me, I couldn't imagine it not being perfect uh, for the occasion and for the moment. May I um, cut it for you? Yeah, please, if you don't mind. Of course, I'll be honored. So with this one, it's a perfecto shape, i.e. tapered at two ends. Okay. And that just means uh, the smoking experience is a little bit different. This is a very old fashioned shape that predates the straight cigars and um, gets used these days less frequently than the straight shape, but still a delicious smoke. Is there a difference in 
and the approach to preparing it. I mean, obviously, this end now is cut. Indeed, this yeah. end you would cut as normal. Um, what I tend to do is I do like to cut a little bit off the oh, foot really? as well, mm -hmm. because otherwise it can be a little bit of a fiddly burn initially. It's a very small aperture. When you cut a little bit into it, it just opens it up more than it would otherwise. And then it's an easier light. May I? Let's do it. Not to deprive you of an no, extra few I mean, millimeters of smoke. <laughs> I like to, you know, jump into the point sooner. <laughs> And my dear Kirby, may I? You know, I'll light it so that yes. we, we may light at the same time. Yeah. I don't wanna, Sounds good idea. I don't want to jump too far ahead. I mean, I have to say it's been such a pleasure to, one, introduce the two of you. I mean, you know, I've got a, such a profound respect for each of you for what it is that you do in your craft. I mean, Simon and Henry Poole, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the founding family of Savile Row, um, having been located on Savile Row since, I mean, when, 18... 1846. 46, yeah. I mean. 1806 we were founded, and that was by James Poole, and his son and father did a successful business by obviously, in a nutshell, was Edward VII and indeed Napoleon III, the two great dandy uh, gentry at the time that brought in a, a wonderful array of customers that allowed them to buy their first, first sort of property in Savile Row, which wow. was you know, back in the well, day. I mean, it's amazing the similarities, you know, between you two, and I will, uh, you know, regale you for a little bit in flattery. But um, I think off camera was the best quite a few times <laughs> where we had mutual customers. Do you remember that where we were we yes. were actually talking and we we're finishing up wrapping the, the series or the scene, and in walks in a client that suddenly, oh, Eddie, you know, how, <laughs> how are you doing, doing here? <laughs> you so, know, I think I think they were thinking. Hmm, I'm paying too much for my cigars. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the economics of Savile Row. If you, anyone that knows and experiences, if you take that suit, which, you know, is an expense in its lifetime, but if you divide it over 20 years, that's the story about Savile Row, and that's what it's all about. Yeah. So there is an economics behind it. Yeah, there really is. And, and it goes back to the, uh, you know, the integrity of the garment, you know, which I always, you know, go back to. I mean, it's made to be beautiful. It's made to be elegant, mm. uh, but it's not uh, in any way meant to be precious. And mm. so there's an integrity to it that allows, that, that ensures and really uh, guarantees it'll look great every single time you put it on, mm. regardless, I mean, there's limits mm. of how rough you are with it. Mm. But also in some ways, more importantly, ensures that the suit can grow with you, mm. shrink with you, yeah. uh, and it really can be something, if well cared for, can uh, last a lifetime. And, and that notion, interestingly enough, is really what led me to start what back then was the Hangar Project, is that you can afford to invest in quality if you know how to take care of it. And then it kind of led me to where we are now, which is, what is quality? And that's what we explore in this channel. You know, what is quality, craftsmanship, and tradition? How does one recognize it? Uh, how does one appreciate it? And uh, that's what, you know, I've loved doing so much here, you know, on this channel. Yeah. I think, you know, you know the fabrics, we work with fabrics. I mean, I, I'm sure it's the same with cigars. In some respects, you're going to have some cigars that will last longer, you know, to keep longer than some other tobaccos. I would imagine it's the same with some fabrics. So, for example, in our world, you know, the worsted suits from Yorkshire will last a good 10, 20. But if you have a Harris Tweed, you're looking at, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. And that's often where you see these great Harris Tweeds made in the 50s and the 60s still sold on many Ebays uh, made in the Savile Row by various houses. So it's a big demand in sustainability that has come now into light uh, with events around the world. I mean, Kirby, we experienced Goodwood and you saw this the sustainability where a lot of people were wearing still Savile Row clothes from 1960s. They had picked up on various houses. So same yeah, thing. Simon, what is it about a Harris Tweed that gives it such life? What, what specifically it's the sheep. I mean, it's the, it's the yarn itself. It's a very, you know, the, imagine the, the climate. Those, you know, sheep are having to survive out there. That, that's a hardy, durable fleece to work with. And it has to be, you know, lasting in that sort of weather condition. So therefore, when you spin it into, you know, into a, a fabric, into a woven yarn, it's got a very sturdy fabric. It's not the kindest fabric. It's not the luxurious fa fabric. But by God, it's going to last you 10 years. And you yeah. Can, yeah, 10 you years, know, I mean. Yeah. Easy. Yeah. I mean, that's a, you know, that's a start. Ten years is just breaking in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what I was going to say. Is <laughs> to break it in, it is. But we see a lot of customers, 
you know, they're patching it on the elbows. They're perhaps putting another color, color on, you know, with another shade maybe to tone on tone to give it another life. They won't give it up. It's like, you know, something they want to keep as long as possible. So the potting shed is where they usually end up, you know, in yeah. the garden, you know, just working away in the garden. Yeah. And that's what's so beautiful about, you know, what each of you do uh, is the opportunity to interact with what it is that you're, you know, enjoying. Mm -hmm. So tailoring, you know, it's something that you live in, you're able to wear, you're able to use. It's not something that is placed on a wall and merely admired or a cigar. You know, you're able to enjoy it with great friends, uh, to celebrate a, a particular moment. And uh, these things over time, in my experience, only deepen the meaning of what it is that you have experienced. Uh, you know, I mean, every single time I see that suit, I'm going to think of this incredible journey, you know, that we embarked on and the opportunity to surprise a good friend with a bespoke suit and to share my passions with him the way he has with me. And you'll hopefully think back of this fondly as, you know, kind of what was the this first uh, first for you? Oh, very much. Uh, you know, this is added to my, I've got a lot of history with the number two, but I've just added a new chapter to it. This is the cigar I smoked when I received my very first bespoke suit. Yeah. I mean, this nice is uh, like an that, extraordinary yeah. moment for me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and the parallels of, of call it the, the purpose of the garment mm. to be worn and to be appreciated um, like a cigar. Mm. You know, th there is a collector's world out there of cigars that perhaps will never be enjoyed. Mm. And that's a shame. That's a little bit sad. It's a disservice to, to, to Mother Nature and, and the craft the skill and expertise that went to producing those cigars. And I imagine it would be the same with, uh, whether it's the textile mills or indeed the tailors mm. themselves. Imagine making clothes that never got worn. Yeah. Um, no, like haute couture, you know, you yeah. see these yeah. creations that you imagine no one will ever wear probably. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a concept rather than an actual, for me, the elegance is, mm. is, is, in, the, is in the function. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Mm. I have to ask, I mean, you know, you've, do you now have it on? Right, you're wearing it. It looks as exceptional as I could have imagined. Um, right, I mean, but please. What was this experience like? I mean, you know, going into it and not really kind of knowing what you were getting yourself into or um, what was, what the process was going to look like. You know, reflecting back, I mean, was there anything that you were surprised by or found yourself particularly enjoying? I have to say, from a distance, before the experience began, I found it very daunting, yeah. the, the thought, the idea of walking into a Salvo Road tailor, mm. put aside the economics, just the experience, you know, feeling I'm not worthy, uh, a sort of uh, imposter syndrome, a <laughs> little bit of those elements, you know, how, who am I to appreciate mm. such an exquisite garment? I don't have the knowledge, the, the background, the, uh, perhaps the, the physique, all those elements. Uh, those things swirl through your mind, and, and, and I think that that was there before I met, of course, our dear Kirby, and more particularly you, Simon. Um, I think what, what immediately changed for me after our first meeting was just how approachable, how user-friendly, mm. how comfortable mm. you made the experience. Mm. You know, you, you took away all the, all the potential moments where you could have made me embarrassed by my lack of knowledge mm. or expertise or, or awareness of the right cut or the wrong cut. You made it so easy for me. Oh, thanks. It's yeah. very kind. I mean, you know, what you said just there is, is quite humbling for me because what you experience is what I hope that happens to the customers come in to pull. It is a daunting. I've heard the story a number of times where those steps up to the door and the bell goes and, you know, you wonder what's going to happen. Is, is there, are there out cameras, something around, is someone's going to come down and see you? But it's a very much a place where you should feel at home. You know, it's a bit like your place here. Yeah. You should feel, feel relaxed. And, you know, if you meet for the first time myself or any of the staff, they, it's that approach where we're very, you know, at, Nate, at one with you. We're not going to put pressure on you to do anything. We're going to educate you. We're going to talk about what you need. And whether this is your first time and it's the only time, it's the one you can afford, or whether you want to build a wardrobe for many occasions in different places around the world, that advice will always be a genuine one that will not give you a pressure to, to do anything only until you're ready and we start the process. And that's the beauty of it. I think that 
makes the customer at ease and at one with the people at pool. And I think that's what you experience. So hearing that today, is, for me, is what pool's about. And I hope that's been through my, my family, obviously my next generation, my two sons, and my wife who works with Henry Pool. You know, that's what we try and give. But also you have to understand, and I hope you saw that, was the team. The team of pool is so much about the company. And they are true bastions of what we do. So whether it be the cutters, the, you know, the actual coat makers, yeah. Even in every division, the strikers, the packers, the secretaries, they, they are at one with the customer, yeah. we hope. Yeah, I mean, Pool in many ways, I, again, as I was saying, bears a lot of similarities to Davidoff of London and that it is still properly family owned and run. Mm. I mean, every day, most days, unless you're traveling, you know, Simon's there sitting at the desk, mm -hmm. attending to customers, mm -hmm. ensuring that everything is uh, working as it should, mm -hmm. and this is the way that it's been since your father, yeah. Angus Kandi, was there, and Samuel, his father, Hugh, and you know, the other Samuel. I mean, it is. I, I, I mi that's for me is the most important thing is to see the the passing of customers coming in to see their changes. I mean, we grew up with them. We we see them as young, you know, sons of fathers, the customers that way to go on to universities, go into jobs, get married, have children, you know, change jobs. We see that throughout lives. And it's just magical when you see that with the customers and generation to generation. We have, you know, four, uh, four generations of American customers, which is quite something. That's, yeah. 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 Cool. yeah. I mean, not very many, I mean, hardly any businesses can claim that. And, you know, with you at Davidoff of London, I mean, it's uh, either you or your father, or most of the time, both of you mm. are always there. And, uh, you know, empl employees, even great employees come and go over the years. But when you have a business that's run by a family, mm -hmm. it allows you to develop these 40-year relationships, or in many cases, four generations mm -hmm. of relationships. And you only get that mm -hmm. whenever you have a true custodian mm -hmm. of a company, uh, you know, and that is what you get ultimately whenever it's owned by family. I think that's the same. I'm sure yeah. you've grown up with it, man and boy. You've seen the yes. customers change. You, they've got to know you, and that's what it's about. And I think that uh, you know, on that sort of way, we're not having a family business is something where you're not overseen by a large conglomerate or a group that you know look for shareholders, look for you know, incomes coming in that will change things for dynamics. And I think with a family fund, you can change it rapidly and help and sort things out quickly versus having a sort of governing house that has five or six companies behind it. So that, for me, the beauty is that we can, you know, when times are tough, like we had there, obviously, you know, we yeah. went through um, yeah. the pandemic. Very tough times. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, we, we helped at the staff. We kept everything going and we brought them back and we, we kept it going. We, you know, you know how apprenticeships work. Apprenticeships, we could actually, you know, kiss goodbye to them never see them again until the work is needed again. But we kept them, we kept those guys, we kept them on, we brought them back, and by God, we need them. Because when yeah. we came back after yeah, the pandemic, boom. everyone wants to dress up again. So, you know, we are full pace again now, which is lovely. Oh, for sure. And and, and I'd like to add also, you know, the, the learning opportunity for me. Mm. You know, as, as a retailer, I'm, I'm sure it's the same for you. When you, when you visit uh, another retailer, um, there's always a lesson to be learned. My father taught me that you either learn by observing what they do and saying, I'll never do that myself, <laughs> mm. which is unfortunately the majority of the time, mm. or occasionally you're very fortunate to enter a retailer and you go, oh my God, mm. this is how I'll do it. This is how it should be done. Mm. This chimes so much with, with how I strive to be with my customers. And that was it, Simon. When, when, when I walked away from each and every meeting I've had in, in pool, I felt like I've been enriched. I've, I've walked away uh, a, a better retailer. You know, the way you handle your customers, your calm demeanor, yeah. the way you're with your colleagues and staff in, in the shop. Um, all of that seamlessly done. At no point did I feel rushed. Did I feel unwelcome? Did I feel awkward or anything at all and i strive to do the same in my business so so it was a learning much opportunity same, as well for much me. the same yeah no i think that's that's a key moment is even though there's lots of in the background noise shall we call it but you know in the front it's calming and when you go through and see your cutter or your workshop 
it's a good atmosphere yeah. and that's what's lovely about it but yeah. i'm sure you know as as my father always said you know is a lot of fireworks can be with within the family but at the end of the day you know you understand that things doesn't need to be changed so much it's just a question of tweaking now and then and i think as i got older i learned to calm down a bit and then sort of realize that you know the wise worlds of the wise world of family businesses you you can change things to, to dynamically um but, but just softly sort of, but softly. Magic, you know? exactly exactly so yeah. you know but it's a, it's living and breathing it we we every night we come home as a family and you know my sons are talking my wife is talking and then we try and have a moment where we off subject but it is it's something in a family business that i think all families have yeah. um, and i think that's what we say but no doubt you do as well I'm, I'm not sure how, how old your sons are. My, mine are. my children are just a little too young to, to officially work in the business, although my daughter's quite keen to skip school and come to work. Uh, yeah. <laughs> come, She's come only 11. Boxes, right? yeah. Yeah. And my, my son will be 15 soon. I really hope that they would have an interest and want to continue. Um, how, how, how have you, have, have you sort of pushed them into getting involved in the business? No, I think, I think that's, that's, I think I learned from my father as my father wanted to be in the RAF, you know, he was desperate to sort of work with the RAF, go into the RAF. And my father, my grandfather always said to him that, you know, he has to make his choice, but, um, you know, let him find his feet. And it was actually his headmaster that reminded him the saying that you do have a good business, you know that. He could think about that. And eventually he did get into Where it. Where was he at school? A place called Framlingham in, in Suffolk. So it was way out of, of town basically he was up there but um you know he came into the london business obviously in br summer breaks and worked with the firm as a young man and eventually he came in and i still remember that you know on saturdays his job was to pack like my mine was to pack uh, he was actually staining and varnishing floors in the, in the old building of savile rose so you know he did many things you know that that was yeah. you know, moving things around in those days but he got into it and his market was very much europe he traveled like I do to the States, but he traveled in Europe. So he became very strong with um, you know, great customers. You saw some of the patterns today. So that was his era, I suppose you'd say. And, you know, the archive book world, the archive books was very much down to Angus, my father and Philip Parker, who's yeah. still with us. Those two gentlemen really were key men that sort of got those books back. We've got to go back into the archives one day. Oh, you, yeah. know, I, you know, Keith was talking about them today and he was really, uh, you know, piquing my <laughs> my interest there. Well, I just want to yeah. kind of leave this on kind of one note, which is, and I think you touched on this a little bit earlier, but it's important enough to revisit. And that is how with both your product, a bespoke suit from Henry Poole, and the product that we're enjoying now, a cigar, mm -hmm. you know, this one from Davidoff of London in the Dominican Republic, but in some ways uh, uh, even more expressed in the Cuban uh, cigars that you sell is how each product is the aggregation of all the hands that touch it. Mm. And that the sum is greater than the parts. And so, you know, here you are with this magnificent suit. We had an opportunity to pop down and kind of see some of it being made at various stages. You know, if you add up all that knowledge, all that, you know, tradition, you know, what you have right here really does transcend just the small bits, you know, and then of course, standing on top of the very tall shoulders of Henry Poole and its tradition, uh, it's just, it's, it's incredible. And I, and still, I'm in awe. It was uh, such an honor to be able to, you know, really um, to participate and to accompany you uh, on this journey uh, and smoking one of these beautiful cigars. I mean, again, the work that goes into it uh, requires an incredible amount of handwork. Now, I often say that a cigar is one of the most accessible handmade products available in the world because yeah. it's only made by hand. There is no, I mean, the only machine that touches this is the truck that probably transports the tobacco from the farm, you know, to the factory. Um, and in, you know, in taking care of this and enjoying it properly as we are right now, taking care of your suit and wearing it enthusiastically is to honor all those people, that quality, that craftsmanship and that tradition. So. Beautifully put, Cheers, Kirby. Kirby. Yeah. yeah. So congratulations, and uh, thank you for allowing us this moment with you. And um, I must ask, uh, Simon, I mean, 
that does the ash, I mean, at some point <laughs> it'll happen, but that, is this encouraged in order uh, for so. moth protection or do we? <laughs> there is a story behind that. So yeah, no, my grandfather was obviously working with um, Sir Winston and he was an avid cigar gentleman. And he always reminded me whenever he came in that he always had to check the pockets because every pocket had a little stub <laughs> of a great cigar inside. But, um, you know, the ash is, is all part of, of, uh, of the joy yeah. uh, of it. But yes, it, it does. The brush comes off, the brush comes out, and yeah. all comes away. But What about the cuffs? I mean. <laughs> the cuffs too. I'll get a little bit of uh, ash in the cuff. Yeah. <laughs> that's for sure. That can happen. But Sir Winston yeah. Churchill's, I mean, his oh, yeah. cuffs, no, it was, I'm sure. <laughs> it was always, a you know, in deep in the pocket here was hidden, always a little piece of a, a cigar ready to be pulled out and lit up again. And, and that's all the time that he used to bring back clothes for alteration, shall we say, is... People got larger in life, and so Winston was that gentleman. We were always were altering and changing things, but you know, part of it was to re, to to make over, look over, repair, make look good. And but my grandfather always said that there was always something in the pockets, you know, some sort of cigars. But yeah, but uh, no, he's a great, great ambassador for, for us, really, Sir Winston. And you know, like you sitting here, he he just looks fabulous, you know, seeing the outline of a Savile Row Henry Poole suit. Thank you so much. And and I promise you it wasn't on purpose, but it did cross my mind that the color lends itself to camouflage some of the ash I may <laughs> True. deposit exactly. on the suit. <laughs> I think that was a good call from Kirby with that, with the, making that gray. It was a good, Very good, much good nice so. call. Yeah. And, you know, to good old Sir Winston Churchill. I mean, a great uh, connoisseur of yeah. your family and, of course, great cigars. So, uh, Eddie, <laughs> you know, thank you for having us. Simon, thank you for... Um, you know, taking us on this incredible journey. And thank you both of you for allowing me to just be a part of it. Mm. <laughs> uh, pleasure, Kirby. Yeah. Always a pleasure. Gentlemen, thank you for filling these walls and honoring the Edward Sahakian Cigar Lounge with your presence. Uh, I could think of no higher accolade. Thank you. Yeah, Eddie, thank you, Simon. Mm -hmm.